Good evening, everyone. Again, a privilege uh, and honor to, to be able to be with you this evening through social media. Uh, we're thankful for the opportunity that we have to do this. We're thankful for the platform that God's provided. Uh, if you would, turn with me. Turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 3. Acts, chapter number 3. And as you're turning there, uh, just to kind of just to kind of give you the background of what's taking place uh, in Scripture up until Acts chapter three, it was uh, this is the beginning of the church. This is uh, this, in chapter two. We saw the day of Pentecost take place. We saw uh, uh, three thousand people come come and get saved, come to know the Lord Jesus, and and convert their hearts and surrender and and baptize and add it to the church. Um, we saw the uh, the promise fulfilled that Jesus made to his disciples of sending the Holy Spirit. We saw that take place. Um, so we move into chapter number three, and we're going to read uh, chapter number three, verses one through eight here this evening. God's word says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in in alms? And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give, or give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaped, he leaped up, he leaped up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Let's open in a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you so much for the opportunity you've given us, Lord, again, to to gather together through social media, through the internet. God, we thank you for this platform that you provide. God, I pray now that you would help each one of us to, to focus on you for the next few minutes, God, and, and what you would have for us in our hearts and in our lives. Father, I pray that you help us to, to, to be better servants for you. Father, I pray that you make us better servants for you. God, that we, uh, that, that we, we, we focus on you and not on self. And God, we focus on, on what it is that you've called us to do. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we look, uh, we, we look at this scripture here in Acts chapter number 3, uh, we begin in, in verse number 1, and it says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And, and what we see is, in verse number 1, is that these disciples, even after something as great as the day of Pentecost, you know, it was, it was a great day. There were thousands saved. There were lives changed. The, the, the church was, was off and running at that particular point. And yet in verse 1, moving transitioning into, into chapter number 3, uh, we see that they're still, they're still doing what it is that, that God, that, that Jesus had, had commanded them to do. They were going to pray. They, they were still going to do the things that, that they knew were right and they knew that they were supposed to do. They were going to the temple to pray. So in verse number two, what we see, and, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb, we see this man, he, he couldn't walk, doesn't specify other than, uh, other than later down where it talks about his ankle bones, it, it doesn't specify exactly what his issue was, but we know that he couldn't walk, he was, he was lame, and this wasn't something that came on him later in life, this is something he was born with, he had lived his entire life this way. Uh, a, certain lame, uh, a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, he couldn't get there by himself. He couldn't get to the he couldn't get to this place where he was at by himself. He had to be carried. And he was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. They laid him at this place because this was a trafficked area. It was, it was where people would come. There would be there would be a, 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 a large number of people. There would be people in and out, in and out. So it was an opportunity for him to ask of gifts of, of people to help him. He couldn't work. He couldn't do anything to to, to provide or sustain himself. So he 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 relied on what others could do to help him. And they laid him by this gate to ask alms of them which entered into the temple. So so that's that's the situation. That's that's where we're at. That's that's that's, That's what's taking place here in this scripture is there's this lame man and Peter and John, they're about to cross paths. They're about to 
to interact with one another. They're about to, uh, their, their, their lives are about to, to come together and we're going to see how great and how awesome God is and how great he can provide and what he can do in our lives if, if, if we're obedient to him. Verse number three, who seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple, asked in alms. So they saw, he saw Peter and John. Did he know who they were? The Bible doesn't specify that either. However, I can say this, Peter and John were pretty popular folks up to this point. People knew who they were. So it, it seems it seems to me that he would know who they were, but even if he didn't, that makes no difference. But but here in verse three, we see that interaction fixing ready to take place. And and I pause right there because I just want to make the point. I want I want to I want to I want to draw this out of the scripture and out of God's word. We come into contact with people every day. Some we know and some we don't. Our our lives intersect with other people every single day. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we respond the way that Peter and John did in this scripture? Do we, is the first thing on our mind, the first thing, our first instinct to talk about Jesus? Or is our first instinct to just kind of do our own thing and, 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 and not worry about that? Verse number four, and Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, look on us. Here's what Peter did to this man. He was lame. He's a, he's a beggar. Uh, he, he, he can't provide for himself. And, and, he, and, and he, he's, he's, he, he's hoping the kindness of other people will help him. Church, I, I can't help but say this here. We're, we're in the same spiritual condition as this lame man was in a physical condition before we meet Jesus. Before, before Jesus, before, before Jesus interacts and intersects our life. We're spiritually lame. We're, we're sitting and we're and, and, and we have no hope. We, we, have, we have no hope. We have no power because we don't have Jesus. But listen to what Peter says to him in verse number four. And Peter fastening his eyes upon him with John said, look at us. Peter said, give me your attention. Let me, let me, let me talk to you for a minute. Give, give, me your, you give me your attention. I, I know in my own personal life that, that, that Jesus did the exact same thing with me. He, he had to because I was trying to run and look around. And, and, and again, just like this beggar, I can see, uh, I can see him as, as people are coming in and out. Again, his, his whole reliance is on the kindness of strangers and what these people are going to give to him. So as people are coming in and out, I can see him kind of looking about, looking around. He sees Peter and John, but he continues to look around. And Peter goes, hey, I got something for you. Look at me. Spiritually, the world is the exact same is the exact same way. The world's all over the place. They're looking over here. They're looking over there. They're 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 taking care of this. And what they really need to do is stop and just look at Jesus. Just stop and look at Jesus. Peter said, "Just look at me. Give me your attention." Is Jesus calling out for your attention today? Is, is Jesus trying to get your attention to do something for Him? If you're saved, I believe that he is trying to get you to do something for him. He's just trying to get you to serve him because that's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to do is serve Christ. If you're not saved, he may be trying to get your attention so that you'll receive him today. But is Jesus trying to get your attention? He wants your undivided attention. Peter wanted this man's undivided attention. He didn't want to battle with all the things that that were going around the temple. He didn't want to compete with all the other things that this man was seeing and experiencing. He needed this man's undivided attention. And Jesus not only wants our undivided attention, but Jesus deserves, deserves our undivided attention. Why does Jesus deserve our undivided attention? Because of Calvary. He deserves our undivided attention because of the cross. Because of the sacrifice that was made on the cross. Jesus deserves our undivided attention Because of an empty tomb, an empty grave, where he's not there anymore. Jesus deserves our attention because he has ascended into heaven and he is at the right hand of the Father. Jesus deserves and demands our undivided attention, just as Peter was requesting from this man. Verse number five. This man understood. He understood the importance of what Peter was about to say to him. He understood the necessity 
of giving Peter his undivided attention. Verse number five. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Now, he didn't know what he was going to get. He didn't know what he was going to receive. But he knew that when Peter said, look at me, there was something serious that was about to take place. There was something important that was about to take place, and he got that. He, 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 he assumed, he knew that he was going to receive something from these men. So what did he do? He gave them his undivided attention. Church, it doesn't take... All we have to do is look in the scriptures, and we don't even have to look very long to understand that Jesus is going to give us something amazing. He already has in salvation. He's given us the opportunity to turn from our sins. He's given us the opportunity to repent, to, to, to turn from a, from a worldly, selfish lifestyle and serve him, and he's given us the, the reward of eternal life through that. So what Jesus wants to give us is incredible. And there's blessings on top of that that he gives us in our life, which again, we don't deserve, but Jesus wants to give us those things. So we ought to understand the importance of giving Jesus our undivided attention and surrender it to him, just as this man did Peter. He knew they were going to give him something. He didn't know what, but he knew something was about to happen. And what was about to happen? Verse number six. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. There's a lot that happens. A lot goes on here in verse number six. There's a lot that takes place. First of all, Peter makes it very clear. He said, I don't have any money to give you. I can't give you, I can't give you any money. I, I, I don't have anything... I, I, I don't have that. That's not what I'm offering you. And I can, and as, as I envision this scripture taking place, as I envision how this all happened and how it all took place, I think about this man, this beggar, this lame man sitting by that gate. And I see Peter tell him, I, I don't have any money, and I can kind of see him get defeated a little bit for just, for just a moment. He just, oh. he's let down. He says, but, but Peter says, but I do have something. He says, such as I have, give I thee. He says, I do have something, and I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you. He says, and then Peter says, in the name of what? Of Jesus Christ. See, again, what Peter's doing, it's not within his own ability. It's not within his own power. It's not something that Peter can do on his own. He's doing this in the name of Jesus. He's doing this with the power of Jesus. He's making it all about Jesus. Church, I'm afraid that, that uh, us as believers, sometimes we've, we've made it about people. Sometimes we've made it about even just the church building. We've made it about a lot of different things. When what it's supposed to be about is Jesus. He, he's the one that needs to be glorified. He's the one that needs to be lifted up. He's the one that needs to be magnified. He's the one that needs to be praised. Not man, not the church building. None of those things. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And what Peter did here was in the name of Jesus because it wasn't anything that he could do in his own power. It was something he had to do through the power of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he says, rise up and walk. See, he wasn't helping this man monetarily. He couldn't. But he was giving this man what he needed more than anything else. And church, we have a message that this world needs more than anything else. We have, we have the word of God. We have the great commission. We have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and this world needs that more than anything. They need it more than money. They need it more than, than, than politics. They need it more than laws. They need it more than policies. They need it more than all of those different things. What this world needs is the Word of God, and what this world needs is the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's what they need. They need it more than anything else. Peter freely gave this man what he needed more than anything else. And what, what, what we do so many times 
is we, we have what the world needs. We have it, and we just hold on to it. It's mine. It's mine. And we choose and refuse to share. We choose not to and refuse to share God's word and the saving grace and the saving message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Peter said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And look what happens in verse number seven. Look what takes place. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Peter reaches down, grabs him by the hand, and pulls him up. I'm so thankful that Jesus decided to reach down and pick me up out of the muck and the mire and, the, and, 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 and just the disgusting life I was living. And he picked me up and he saved me and he set me on the rock and he cleaned me up. And he made me into a new person for him. But Peter reached down by the right hand, lifted him up, and listen, and immediately, immediately, there was no, there was no weight, there was no, immediately, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately this man could walk. In the name of Jesus, this man who was a beggar, who was lame, he couldn't do anything for himself. For the very first time in his life, he stands to his feet. Praise God. And then verse 8. We're going to stay here for a few minutes. Because again, there's a lot that takes place in verse 8. In verse number 8. And he leaping up stood. What's the last thing that took place in your life? What is it in your life that happened? What's the last thing that took place in your life that caused you to leap, caused you to jump, caused you to, caused you to physically leave your feet in excitement and in joy? Did it have anything to do with Jesus? It should have. Because he's the only thing worth, worth praising and worth worshiping in the first place. But what is it in, the, in your life? What is the last time that caused you to leap? Think about what, what, what had taken place in the life of this man. From verse number two, where he was a lame man that had to be carried to the temple each and every day to beg, to verse number eight, where he's leaping onto his feet. The excitement that must have been taking place in that man. Again, I compare that to, to, to our salvation when we receive Jesus Christ. As our personal Savior, I can tell you this about my own personal experience getting saved. When that happened, it felt like the weight of the world was lifted off of my shoulders. And I was leaping and I was ready to jump and, and run around and praise God for what he had done in my life. Because it is a miraculous thing that the, that the saving power of Jesus Christ can come onto the heart and come into the life of a person and change who they are. And it's something we ought to get excited about. You know something else that'll make, that ought to make us leap with excitement and joy in the Lord as believers is when we have the opportunity to lead somebody else to Christ. Like Peter reached his hand out and lifted this man up. When we reach our hand out and, 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 and we help somebody to understand who Jesus is and what he had done for them, that ought to, that ought to give us an excitement and a joy that renews and rekindles the fire within us to serve God. But he leaping up stood. And listen, this, this is the, the first thing that this man did, the first thing that he did when he was healed, and walking and entered with them, where? Into the temple. This man had received something from God. He had received something from Jesus. And the very first thing he wanted to do, he wanted to go praise God. He wanted to go worship God. He, he was excited to go give God, to go give Jesus the praise and the worship and the glory that he, he so richly deserves. You remember that time? Remember when you got saved? Remember when Jesus made that change within you? Remember when Jesus, remember when Jesus changed your heart? Remember, remember, when, he, remember when, he, when he took that person who was dead inside and gave him that new life? Remember when that took place in your life? Remember how excited you were? Maybe how excited the folks around you were? Church, what happened? What happened? So many times we, we come into God's house on Sunday mornings and it's just, good morning. Oh, praise the Lord, glad to be here. Are, are, are you really? 
Are you really happy to be in God's house? Are you really glad to be here? Are you really expecting to meet with God? Church, our excitement for the things of God has, has, has dwindled. He, this man got it. He entered with them into the temple. What was he doing? He was walking. He was moving. He couldn't be still. He had this new gift from God, and he wanted to use it. He was walking. And again, the second time in this verse, he said he was leaping. Man, just the joy and the excitement that must have been in this man's life. He was leaping. Church, when's the last time we left in the, in the house of God? I'm not talking about being silly and foolish and, and running around and being crazy. But I'm talking about when's the last time we were in God's house and we were excited about what God was doing? When's the last time we came to church and we said, man, I cannot wait to see what God's going to do today. And then when he does it, it excites us. That's been missing from the church for a long time. And I'm not just picking on, on one church. I'm not just talking about a church. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about the church, the body of Christ. We become complacent. We become, we become kind of happy with where we are and what we got. And what we need to do is we need, we need, we need, to, we need to, to strive to see God do amazing things. We need to be ready to be used by God. And how do we do that? Praising God. Verse 8, the end of it. He went in with them into the temple, walking and leaping, and lastly, what? Praising God. Imagine that. They went into the temple, praising God. I believe that we would take so much more, things, things, things at, at church, when we come to church, Things would be so much different if when we got here, we were praising God. We were praising God when we got here. Even before we got here. Again, he hadn't even walked into, he, 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 he hadn't walked into the temple yet. And he was still leaping and excited and happy and praising God. It wasn't until the end of verse 8 that he went into the temple and he was still praising God. Imagine how much different church would be if we were praising God even before we got here. How about on our, way, on our way to meet together in church? Our conversation in the car or our conversation with the Lord maybe is, is, I cannot wait to see what God does. Man, I'm excited to see what God, God, thank you for all that you've done already, but, but I cannot wait to see what God does today. Imagine, what, how, imagine how different and how amazing things would be if we came into the house of God expecting God to do something. Ready to see God, ready to see God work. Imagine how different our church experience would be. You see, this man, this, this event that takes place here, this lame man being healed through, through Peter by Christ. This that takes place, see, he, he understood. He got it. It took this miraculous thing to take place for him to understand the power of God and what God wanted to do in his life. But church, I would say that, 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 that Jesus has done some pretty miraculous things in our lives as well. That ought, to, that ought to wake us up, that ought to make us realize, hey, listen, this God is a God worth praising, this God is a God worth glorifying, and this God is a God worth serving. Our God. Our God is worth our service. Our God is worth our praise. We need to come into God's house, and we need to expect and, and, and be ready for God to do something amazing. We need to come in with joy. We need to be ready to meet with God. Why? Why? So that we can hold on to it and keep it to ourselves and say, man, that was great. Let's go eat lunch. No, no. We need to come in expecting God to do something in our lives, to do something amazing so that we can take it out into the world. Why? Verse number nine. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And into verse number 10, and they knew that it was, it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Church, here's the question. When you go out into the world, when you go to work your job, when you go to the grocery store, when you go get gas for your car, when you do whatever it is that you do, does this world look at you 
with wonder and amazement at what has taken place in your life. They ought to. It ought to be that clear that you're that much different than the rest of the world. We ought to live to where verse number 10 can take place and people look at us with wonder and amazement and they cannot help but wonder what happened. What, what do you have that I don't have? It's a different sermon for a different day. But the rest of this chapter, as you continue to read, Peter preaches that exact message. He preaches that you're, wonder, you're in wonder and you're in amazement over what? Over what God could do. And then as we move into chapter number four, we see another multitude of people get saved and come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. It started with one man. It started with one man who was not afraid to show his excitement, who was not afraid to show his joy in what God had done in his life. Church, it's time that we, we, we put away the, the fear. It's, it's time that we put away the, the, uh, the worry and the nervousness about sharing Jesus. It's time that we just let people see who Jesus is and we show them that we are different and we show this world who Jesus is so that they can look with wonder and amazement at what God has done in our lives so that we can then take Jesus to that lost and that dying and that darker by the day world that we live in. Church, we need to be. We need to be the type of believer that this man was in verses 8, 9, and 10. We need to, we need to trust him. We need to follow Christ. We need to let people see what it is that he's done in us and, and see how amazing and how wonderful our God is. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we do, <clears throat> we do thank you again for the opportunity you've given us to come together and to expound upon your word. Lord, we're thankful for your scripture. We're thankful for how it can show us, Lord, just how it is we're supposed to be because of the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful things that you've done for us. God, I pray that you'd help each and every one of us, Lord, to go out into this world that we live in. And God, live a life that causes people <laughs> to be in amazement and be in wonder of what it is that you're doing in our lives. God, that we could be the witness that you have called us to be. God, that we could be the light to the world that you've asked us to be. God, we could share Jesus with a lost and dying world. Father, we love you. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, we miss you on Sunday nights. We miss the opportunity of coming together and worshiping in God's house together. But until the time we can come back on Sunday nights, we're going to be praying for you.